Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hopefully, uh, you didn't partake too much last night, and uh, you're alive and well this morning. Uh, last time when we were in, we talked about um, architectures, we talked about products, we talked about uh, some of the direction the company was going. Uh, today, we're going to shift a little bit, and I'm actually shifting a little out of my element in that, that many of you know me, I'm an RF guy. I, I, that's my background is RF heavily. But I'm going to talk about some, some other things here that we're doing today. Um, in the last point, or the last time we were in, we talked a, a number of pieces. Um, since then, one of the things we've introduced, not, not real sexy and hot, and that's the new 532E. You'll notice it's got external antenna connectors on it. Customers were looking for the, the 532, the new technology, the newer, smaller form factor. But they were looking for things they could do some of the unusual stuff with, like warehousing where you need directional antennas, um, being able to put it up in the plenum space and run cables down to an antenna below. So the E is out and shipping, been out for a, a few months. Um, not Again, not a terribly exciting piece, but one of those pieces that is required for certain installs. One of the other things we've done, and we walked through our controller line, and uh, we've introduced a new controller. Um, this is the uh, 32AP controller. Sure. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we realized there was a little bit of a gap in, in our area, and we'll talk more about this later, but we've got a new controller as well coming around. I'll go ahead and send that around. So a couple of little things we've got there. The other part that uh, we've done is we've actually got onto our price list now, and, and shipping is, we, and we briefly talked about it, we did a demo before, was SmartPass Connect. BYOD. Um, it is one of the things that's haunting customers left and right. How do we take, you know, these fancy little devices that we're all carrying now and get them onto the network quickly, easily, and painlessly from the IT staff? And with SmartPass Connect, uh, we're, we're able to do that. Um, you know what? We didn't walk through a, a slide here. <laughs> that's all right. Let me jump through that. So I'm not... We, I, we have probably 12 slides for the whole day, guys. Mm -hmm. So um, this one, though, is hard for me not to use a slide with because on the whiteboard it's tough to move stuff around. So they did a nice job with this. With SmartPass Connect, it's one of the things that we've integrated into the Juniper, Juniper portfolio. It's not just a piece that's bolted on. It's not just a, 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 you know, a, an addition to your network. It becomes part of the network, just like wireless is. Um, you go back a number of years and wireless was one of those pieces that you plugged onto your network. In fact, I remember the day when wireless was, had to be outside the firewall. You wanted to come in, you had to VPN through even your own network and wireless network in your building. Now it's an integrated part of that network and if we don't actually take and treat it that way, it becomes very difficult to manage, very <laughs> difficult to grow, and difficult to do things like this. So in the case of, of our SmartPass Connect, the, the, the best thing about it is the fact that as an employee walks in with a device, they can provision it quickly and easily. Um, when they come online, they're going to tie it to a captive portable, captive portal, excuse me. It's been a long week for me. <laughs> I was in Virginia on Monday and Tuesday. Um, and from there, what happens is they'll, talk, they'll come in and they'll, they'll hit the wireless controller. The wireless controller is going to send the session over to our SmartPass server. Well, once that happens, the smart pass is looking at it and says, okay, well, we're going to redirect that and we're going to um, present information around provisioning to the smart pass connect. This is a software piece that, that redirects and sends it to the smart pass connect server. Smart pass connect server un evaluates a few things about what came in and it's going to send back a supplicant wizard to the client device. So it's actually shipping a wizard to my client device it's going to ask for my credentials. It's going to install a, a little piece of software on it at the moment to help this out. So I, as a user, I came in, I logged on to the guest network, and now it's coming back and asking me some questions. So once that happens, the provisional, the, the information coming back from that wizard is going to check credentials against the AD, say, yep, you're, you're Bruce A. You belong on my network. And so what I'm going to do is validate everything, and then I'm going to shove information back to the client. I'm going to shove a configuration back to the client. 
I'm going to shove a cert back to the client, and I'm going to get everything out there you need, and then this little piece of software I gave you goes away. So it doesn't leave stuff on your, your device. Question for you, Bruce. Yeah. Is, uh, a, is the Smart Class, class Connect using SCEP to push the certificate out to uh, the client? I'm sorry? Is the Smart Class Connect using SCEP to push the certificate out? I'm going to look at Tim. I know that. Um, not, in this exchange here, it's not SCEP. Um, it's uh, skip like but it's a proprietary uh, change between the Smart Class Connect wizard and the server. Okay. One of the, uh, one of the hurdles with SCEP is with the Microsoft's PKI infrastructure, SCEP certs uh, show up as the, uh, the cert admin, so their the ownership of the cert is uh, it's not quite as clear. So mm -hmm. the association between the cert and the user that requested it is not quite as clear in that regard. Okay. So one of the things that SmartPass Connect does is the actual cert is requested on behalf of the user. So it's a little it's a little bit clearer in that regard where that ownership lies. So it makes it like a user cert for the device. Exactly. Okay. Cool. So yeah. Sorry. The. Uh, Dissolvable agent. What is what is that? What have you plugged it with? Is it Java? Is it ActiveX? Is it and which platforms is it supported on? Um, platform supported on virtually it's 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 Windows, it's iOS, it's uh, Android, it's Mac. Um, so yeah, so it's Linux, you know, OS, <coughs> Linux, Windows, you know, so the uh, iOS, Android, um, depending on the platform that's connecting, that's. Uh, Smart Pass Connect will serve the sort of platform appropriate manager and agent. So on iOS, it's all delivered via HTML. Um, on Windows, it's ActiveX. On OS X, it's, it's either Java if the platform has Java or you know, uses the .NET config structure that iOS uses. Yeah. So there's intelligence built into this to, to serve the right, right The idea is from the user, he gets his information back. He doesn't know what's going on. All he knows is my screen said this, and I'm going to give you my credentials. Out it goes. Back it comes, and once the user gets that, that information dissolves, then he'll select the new network that says, go to this network, click on this, and you're on the network. You no longer have to put more credentials in because you've got a cert on your machine, and you're logged into the network. And it, it takes it all the way through. And between SmartPass Connect, our controller, and the SmartPass software that's redirecting it, as a user, you really logged in in a matter of a minute or two. It, this happened very quickly. See? Other than um, supplicate configuration, does it have any hooks into like the Microsoft Security Center, like check to make sure the firewall is enabled or anything like that? SmartPass does. Uh, that's actually part of SmartPass, right? Uh, Tim? Nope, that's that's part of SmartPass Connect. So, okay. so those, that exact use case, uh, there's there's a lot of functionality built into the wizard that uh, while it's doing the provisioning step, it can also um, you know, do a lot of NAC like checks. Yep. So looking for things like firewall, um, checking uh, uh, wireless driver version numbers or date strings. So there's a number of checks that can do while it's running. Um, it can be used to, to bootstrap um, like a, a NAC agent. So if you're, say you need to install Pulse and change on the SmartPass Connect wizard as it's moving through its provisioning step, you can download and install, you can install a third-party package and as, as part of its on yeah, the, the, the whole idea is to, to make it as painless as possible for the, uh, the user to get on the network. And the fact that no one has to, he has, doesn't have to go to a help desk, doesn't have to go to a receptionist to get information, IT doesn't have to touch the device. So it can come in, it can get provisioned, and it can be on the network. So <clears throat> as we look, look at that, that's now being shipped. Customers are starting to use it. Um, colleges are one that really like it. Hospitals have looked at it very closely and are starting to use it. Um, those, those are probably the two biggest areas right now where unusual devices are coming into the, the industry. I mean, in the enterprise carpet space, we're doing it too, but these guys are doing it and they're, they're pushing to have it done quickly. So that's, those are probably the two biggest markets for this today. So, um, Bruce? Yes, sir. Sorry. Um, on the Android, uh, deployment of the client to Android devices. <coughs> on this, I believe Cisco, make, you, you have to install uh, an app from the store in order to do it with ICE. Is there something, is there similar restrictions? I mean, it's obviously it's an Android sort of issue. What, yeah, how exactly. do you guys handle it? Um, so yeah, so we, um, we have that same sandbox limitation that, sure. that you've seen. So, so it's, it's a, yeah, an Android so there's, Yeah, there's a little shim application that you know, that 
it will redirect you to to the store to download. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Pull that down and then it, then it takes off from there. Sure. Um, yeah, an unfortunate limitation of the uh, platform. Sure. So let me throw a little question out, just a, a nod of the head or whatever. Um, recently, well, a few months back anyhow, Gartner released some statistics that 80 some percent of the white collar users, white collar workers now use wireless. 65 percent of those said, I can't do my job without it. That sound reasonable to you? Sound like the industry that we're talking about? Yeah. If not more. If not more. Mm -hmm. You get into colleges, it's probably 100%. Actually, higher. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I just was with a K through 12 uh, customer, big customer, and they are now delivering, I forget the name of it, let's just say the state accreditation tests that we have to take in like fourth grade and sixth grade and ninth grade. They're delivering them on iPads. What's that mean? That means wireless. And if the wireless goes down, the state accreditation testing goes down, to me, that sounds like it's a mission critical network. Used to be a few years back, we talked about mission criticalness for people like hospitals where you know, the, the caregivers are carrying tablets or carrying you know, something that has to be on a network because nothing's being done on paper anymore. That's migrated to places we wouldn't dream of being mission critical like K through 12. But when a school loses its accredit its national or state testing, all of a sudden they're having troubles. So that idea of mission critical goes well beyond what the traditional mission critical was. And we're taking a look at that in Juniper and, and starting to really talk about it. Now, when we chatted last time, six about six months ago, I think, doesn't seem that long ago. We talked about high resiliency. And again, a uh, question I have for the group here, is that something you see customers are asking for to make sure their wireless stays up all the time? OK. So um, there's a few new faces in here from, from what I saw, a few new names I, I saw on the list as well that I don't recognize. Um, just real quick, like, to, and my apologies for the whiteboard kind of being to the back of some folks. For those of you that, that um, weren't here, we've got our controller. Well, that's a strange whiteboard. Um, then we have the switch, the network. Think of it as the network, the AP. Um, and what happens is traffic typically, for a lot of users, go up to the controller and then comes back down. We do local switching. So the traffic goes to the switch and then to the network. It doesn't have to go through. Because of that, and that, that one key, that's one of the things that brings resiliency to our network. We do that on all devices. We do that on all controllers. And keep that in the back of your mind when you think about Juniper. Think local switching. Think data flow doesn't go to the controller. And, and I know that later when, when some of the other guys come up and talk about our new controller and some of the new things that Jonathan alluded to, That'll play an important piece in it as well. Because there's some futures that this has a huge impact on. And we want to make sure we, we talk about that. The always up wireless network. And that's what we've strived to do for a long time. And we continue to strive to do that, is make sure that that resiliency stays in place. I mean, it used to be a number of years back, we talked about making sure you had a good overlap for coverage. Then it was make sure that you turn the power down so that if an AP goes down, the surrounding APs can turn their power up and fill in. That was an RF resiliency. Those design tactics are still, still required today in these places. But beyond that, you've got to make sure that if other things happen on the network, the APs can continue to operate with the uh, resiliency that you need for that mission critical system. I don't know why I picked up that. I don't need it. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that we want to talk about is performance. And I missed, Keith, I missed your, your session last night. We tried to watch it, but it wasn't streamed. So um, I don't, did you guys record it by chance? Yeah, we recorded it. Okay, good, good. I get a chance to catch up on that. So, but performance means a number of things to different people. Um, to the end user, performance means, hey, I can get on a network and it works. It's Ethernet-like. To the IT staff, performance means it's easy to manage, and I'm not going to have trouble with it. I'm not going to get calls from the end user. 
It used to be performance was about RF when it's wireless. And, uh, you know, the old saying that one of my bosses used to have when um, somebody, a new company that had been brought in where I was working, made the comment that you don't need to worry about access points. Throw them out there, hang them up, and the controller will do everything for you. Hope and hang, or hang and hope, that's what we used to call that. Um, so my boss used to say, if you take the radio out of an AP, what do you have? Nothing. So RF is important. As long as we get the RF design and the coverage put in place properly, and it operates properly, we need to take that step back farther and talk about the network piece of wireless and the performance at the overall system. With a, a locally switched system, we can get the performance higher than we can get if we have to shove everything through a controller. Network traffic is cut in half from the wireless. We don't have to worry about the size of the data pipe and the controller for traffic. So those are some of the things that performance is based on as well. And we continue to try to increase and improve some of that. Are there any restrictions, Bruce, on, I, I can't remember if this was asked last time, but restrictions on the number of APs? The number of APs per- be distributed or local, local, local. Um, It's actually a number of controllers. We can put 32 in a cluster. Um, and then the controllers can handle up to 512 APs per controller, so we can scale to thousands. But the number that are locally switched, no. It's, it's, it's a bigger picture than that is how many APs can we overall put on a network, how many controllers can we put on a network. The locally switch factor doesn't have that effect. So with a, so with a controller that supports 512 APs, you set a single or a pair for redundancy, 512 of those APs in one network. Could can be locally switched? Mm -hmm. I'm going to look back over at our engineers and make sure that I'm not speaking out of turn, but yeah. We, we, we do that, and quite honestly, I'm, I'm working with a system right school right now where we're talking about, uh, let's say, over 4,500 access points all locally switched. So um, we've got redundancy built in for, a, a, actually, they have several data centers, and we've redundancy built in, so if a data center goes away, all the APs will stay alive. So you can have centralized... Are there any software limitations if you wanted to have a pair of controllers in a data center, whatever the maximum number of AP licenses you support is, and then you, let's say you've got 20 sites, and then you might have 50, 100 APs at each of those sites? No. Yeah, no. So that's actually not, not a common point scenario. Sure. Yeah. So one of the, uh, one of the design goals of the local, uh, local switching feature set is that um, it comes with without limitations. So there's, um, you know, there's any AP, whether it's coming back to a controller, whether it's forwarding locally, it doesn't really matter. It becomes just a you know, design consideration for you know, whoever's architecting the network. Um, yeah. There's no feature limitations, so you know, all, of the, uh, you know, all of the features you would expect when operating you know, in a centralized mode mm -hmm. are fully supported as well in you know, the distributed mode. So um, all of your, um, your ACLs, all of your quality of service, all of the uh, sort of application awareness, all the things that we do in overlay mode are, are available at the, at the AP and distributed mode as well. What about with WAN, loss of WAN connectivity? Sure. So there's a whole, whole set of features around uh, WAN survivability. Right. Um, you know, obviously there are, you know, there are things that change when the WAN goes down. Um, but yeah, but you know, once, when APs are deployed across the WAN, it's you know, control, command and control stays centralized. Traffic is distributed out to the edge, and it's kind of no limitations on how we do that. Mm -hmm. And along those lines, um, I won't mention their name, but I've got a customer that I work with out east that has right now 800 in some sites. They're hoping to grow it to about 1,000 by the end of this year. Um, they have just a couple APs at each site, but all their controllers are stacked in one building in the east coast. And they're, these are spread around. Most of them in the U.S. and Canada, there's a few internationally. The international ones they haven't deployed yet. They're looking at how they're going to do that way. They have an SRX sitting at each one of these sites, so they have a um, a, a tunnel, you know, a VPN link back. Mm -hmm. So they're not using remote AP. Uh, Tim was talking about WAN survivability for remote APs. But they're all locally switching because they're printing and all the other things are done in their local office. But it's a training company and they pull the education material from corporate. So, and they've moved all their training to iPads, which meant they have to be wireless. So are there limitations in terms of WAN latency for control packets? There is latency for that in um, 125 milliseconds. So it depends on the mode of operation and kind of what it is that's happening. Um, so in a WAN deployment, we, you know, we two seconds is, you know, is, um, is kind of one of those thresholds we use. 
when operating in kind of the sort of the classic overlay mode. So you have an AP deployed across a WAN that you know it doesn't it isn't configured as a WAN AP, then there's a, you know, around 100 milliseconds. Yep. The same latency you would expect on a local AP. Can you can you speak up, please, when you're speaking? Because we can't hear you on the stream. Ah, uh, volume challenged. Yep. Yes, yeah. It's always it's always my yeah. problem. Yeah. <laughs> or you can use that. Or we can use yeah. this. You're going to need that next then, how to. Yeah, all right, fair enough. Um, so it depends on the deployment, basically. Yeah, so typically what would, how that would work is, um, you know, when an AP is deployed across a WAN, it's configured as such. Um, so it has it has a, a different set of timing constraints. And two seconds is what, you know, is what we use kind of for max sure. at the WAN edge. And when we're deployed in what's known as remote AP, we have a WAN outage and configurations. But that AP can stay alive for, I think it's up to five days is the maximum time zone that it has a tactical control. So there's... There's resiliency built into even the remote AP. Let's say we were doing a retail store environment where we've got controllers at corporate and we've got an AP sitting at each one of these small, um, you know, mom and pop type stores. Um, if that LAN goes down, we know sometimes they're not the most reliable when they're by internet connection. Um, <coughs> the AP will stay alive. They still have their, their barcode scanning going on. They can still print tags, things like that. So we've got that built into the, the remote AP side. Mm -hmm. And we've actually ran through some pretty good testing with it, um, with with another customer where we found, you know, the default numbers that they put in weren't exactly great for some of their things. We tweaked the the, the uh, um, timeouts on them, and now they've they've been clicking along for several months without an issue. So we we realize that the internet is at best a, a good thing, but it's not perfect. So we got to build build around it. Okay, um, as we talk about performance, um, as I started to mention, performance is really, I mean, we have different ways to view it. We view it from the IT staff, we view it from those of us that are technical, especially RF focused, but in reality, performance should be based on user experience. How well does it work for the user? And we actually had a customer, and um, I think, Tim, you're gonna talk about uh, the college that did a test, right? Uh, briefly, yep. Okay. Um, that actually put in multiple systems, and they let the students decide what was the system to work best for. So uh, we'll talk about that coming up here la later on. Some of the other pieces that help improve performance that we continue to improve on, load balancing, um, band steering, which is becoming huge now that the, uh, the five series phones are out, the three series um, tablets are out, uh, the dual band devices that are coming to market now. Um, pushing them to 5 gig gives us so much improved performance that um, it just gets away from the 2.4 stuff. So that's that's huge. The other piece that we talked about, and we actually talked about it in depth last time, the, the difference um, between 5 gig and 2.4 cell sizes and what we've done to, to make those concentric cells. So we continue to make sure that we try to make that the coverage area, the, the band steering, so that the users have the performance level we need. That's that's one of the things we put a lot of effort into recently is that user point of view. Question on that. After your your last discussion of how you went with larger five gig antennas, so you had a bigger aperture so you could get closer to the two four. Right. How, have you tested that? Is that I mean your same power, about the same size coverage? Right. We have tested it and in the you know, in the five thirty two we have here on the ceiling, for instance, the now this will obviously there we go, where it went. This one might be a little different because it's going to depend on the antennas that you attach to it. But for that, a concentric cell size in a typical um, school or commercial environment, yeah, they're very close to the same same distance you would expect when you do your survey and do your design statistics. So it, it seems to work pretty well. There's going to be obviously there's going to be some sites that because the walls are you know maybe they're made out of different materials whatever that five gig has more attenuation, but in general. Um, they've got similar similar cell boundaries, and that makes it easier to design and deploy as well. Um, the other thing that we continue to do, and we're going to talk a lot more about coming up, is wired and wireless integration. You know, we continue to drive down the path that wireless isn't just an add-on that you bolt onto it. It's actually got to be integrated to your network. Otherwise, your cost to maintain it and manage it goes through the roof, and it becomes so we say the weak link in the chain of how do I make sure everything works together. When, when we do that, we can reduce the cost of ownership. Um, and we do things, and we start using industry standards like IF map to help share information from the client, makes it easier for the client. 
We want the client to have the same experience whether they plugged in the wall at my office or whether I'm on the wireless here. Quite honestly, we need to fix that in our building over at six because it's different. Um, and then management, I'm gonna talk more about management in a couple of minutes. I'm gonna get down deep in it and uh, we'll, we'll do a demo with Rashish back there as well. Um, BYOD, I mentioned um, SmartPass Connect. That's something that we continue to grow on, we continue to harp on because it's a pain point for our customers. It really is a huge pain point for us. Um, the, the CIO over at Edu or the CIO meeting at Educause, um, talking with, with Bob Johnson who was over there, one of his co complaints he heard over and over and over again, the wireless is too hard to maintain. If we can't make it easier, I want to give it to somebody. As, a, as a, an IT guy, I would cringe the thought of giving a piece of my network to somebody else to handle. Either I'm going to give it all to somebody, or I want to do it here. How do we do that? How do we actually get it together so that I can maintain it easier? That is the number one complaint coming from the CIOs at schools. How do I manage it and make it easier to do that with? 